You want to live a life on fire and on mission. You want to be filled with such conviction and drive that you stop caring about what anyone thinks. You want to face each day alive, authentic, and fully present in every moment with your wife, with your kids, on the street, at work. You want to bring yourself to the table and to stop bringing the watered down, nice, what everyone wants version of you. You want that self to be a man who is burning in passion for Jesus, unafraid to bring his kingdom to anyone in your path, no matter what it costs you. You want to love the one in front of you without fear, without needing love back, and without reserve. You want to husband well. You want to father well. You want to shepherd your life well. You want to be a safe pillar for anybody around you. You want to experience God for real, to not just believe, but to know that He's got you and that He'll show up on your behalf, that He'll show up through you. You want to get to the end of your race and say, Yep, I gave it everything. Jesus, you know I'm all in. And you want to know just how to get there. Welcome to Man Warrior King. I'm your host, Matt Halleck. Congratulations. You're among the violent taking the kingdom by force. You're among the chosen answering the call to rise above yourself. You're in the forge being stripped down and strengthened, and you will rise stronger, solid, unshakable. You are a man. You're a warrior. You are a king. To encourage you to check out the ranks of a doulum. We are getting ready to launch the brand new format that I'm super excited about, and it is it has taken a shape and form that I believe is me handing it over into the into the hands of the Lord, and the Holy Spirit is going to set it on fire and change the lives of men around the world through this thing, and we are getting ready to launch that. All right, the launch date for our first official live meeting is going to be August 10th. That's a Tuesday. August 3rd, if you sign up before then, we'll get a, you'll get a bonus live session on August 3rd. The deadline for the lowest price you'll ever see in the ranks of a duelum at $50 per month is going to be Wednesday, August 4th. All right, so we are coming up on that deadline for signing up there uh, if you want to take advantage of the $50 a month price tag. I highly encourage you to do it. It will change your life. There's no commitment for you to stay beyond any certain length of months at all. Although I will say this, there is an initial three-month intensive training program that if that I would really, really strongly advise that you stick it out for those three months because that's going to give you a complete and well-rounded foundation on which to go forward in your life. All right, so that is the ranks of a doulum. The URL, if you want to go check it out, is manwarriorking.com slash adulam, A-D-U-L-L-A-M. I will put a link to it in the podcast show notes for you. All right. So, mm -hmm. yes, like I said, feel free to throw comments, prayer requests, things like that in the chat or, or the comments on Facebook. Uh, but here we go. So last week, we spent the whole time... Uh, in the first chapter of the Song of Solomon. And actually, we also talked a little bit about Proverbs and things like that too, but we didn't get beyond chapter one of this book, of the Song of Solomon. And um, for those of you who just need the quick refresher, one of the main things about it was that we see the picture of the man who is not revolving around his woman uh he was out doing other things and actually he invites her into his realm and so often we feel as though we are less than in our marriages and so we're always hanging on waiting around for our wives to invite us into into her realm um and and so in order for us to enter into a more healthy relationship, we have to become more of a high value man, not only in the, in the relation to the world, but in, in the eyes of our own selves, we have to realize that we have high value. And that doesn't actually have to mean that we become self-centered and arrogant 
and demanding and a jerk. If we truly believe that what God says about us is actually real, that we are honored, that we are precious, that we are secure, that we are covered and set, that we have everything we need, then it actually frees us to serve. It actually frees us to love well. If we don't believe that, then we're constantly manipulating. We're constantly trying to get, 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 get. And when we get demanding, when we get arrogant, it's because we know that we should have a high value, but we still don't really believe it. We're still insecure. And I will say this, the path to security is not necessarily found in the heat of the moment in relationship, in, in, in communication with our wives or the woman. Our path to security is found in the in-between times on our own when she's not there. We build security in our time with the Lord. We build security in his furnace, in the presence. And then we come down from the mountain like Moses with our face glowing because we've been with him and we are changed. And we relate down with our boots on the ground in a different way because of what we've done on our own. Because God, we have been spending time with him, giving him free reign to work in us. So, in this next chapter, we see a sign of, of a man's security. Okay, so demanding arrogance, all those things can be a sign of insecurity. But this thing right here can also point to whether we are secure or insecure. All right, so uh, let me let me share the correct window with you, gentlemen. And let me be able to see it. Okay. So in this second chapter, it says, this is, it starts with the woman saying, I am a rose of Sharon, um, a lily of the valleys. And I know there's, there's a lot of meaning to that that I'm not too familiar with, but I know it's a very significant thing. Uh, I actually find it kind of cool that in the new house that we just uh, bought and are moving into, we have two plants called the rose of Sharon uh, on our property which is pretty cool. They're actually really beautiful, um, which was just significant to me given all this work that we're doing here. So she says that. And then the man says this, as a lily among brambles, so is my love among the young women. All right. So that's a very short and simple statement, but I think there's a lot to unpack there because like I said, how a man handles this is a sign of whether he's secure or insecure. See, Jesus walked the earth for 33 years, and he spent three of those years in close communication and close relationship with the beginnings of his church, right? His disciples. And he was up close and personal with all of their shortcomings. He was up close and personal with all of their betrayals 
their lies, their, their ignorance, their inability to actually understand what he was giving all of himself to communicate. He was knowingly going to give up everything and also knowing that he would be betrayed and abandoned in his hour of need. He would be alone. His disciples, his church is his bride. And in all of that, he was still able to look them in the face and say, I've called you my friends. He was able to look them in the face and say, as the father has loved me, the most love possible, so have I loved you. He was able to look at them and say, I give you authority just like I have. And it says in Hebrews that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And I believe that joy is very deep and wide and multifaceted. I believe that joy is, is the joy of reunification back with his father. I believe that joy is the joy of having completed his mission in, in obedience to his father. I believe that joy is just the joy of conquering death. And now he gets to reign in glory forever. But I also believe that joy is the reconciliation of himself to his church. And it says for the joy set before him, he endured the cross because he saw a thing. He saw what we were meant to be. He looked at us and he didn't say, you worthless pieces of scum. He looked at us and he said, you precious sons and daughters. He looked at us and he said, you crown jewels in Isaiah on my head. See, so... He saw us for our identity. And he didn't say my church is just one of the many brambles all around. He could have said that, but he said, my church is a lily among brambles like this in verse two here. Right, so Jesus, he's able to see us in our identity. So now as a, as a husband, as a man with a woman, if I am secure, actually, we'll start with, if I'm insecure, then my thinking is going to be often, the, the, if not the majority of the time, going to all these places of all the thorns in my wife, all of the brambles that I see and that I have experienced, that I have felt the pain of. If I'm insecure, then I'm going to be thinking about how I wish she were different in this way or that way. How I often use this, this, this uh, like formula, if my wife would just blank, then I could finally blank. If I'm insecure, then her brokennesses are going to grow and take up my perception. And I will not be a man who can say with conviction and passion and honesty that my woman, my wife is a lily among all the rest are like thorns compared to her. And here's the problem. For many of us who have been insecure in our relationships, 
we started off saying this well. Well, I don't know if it was well. We started off saying this. We started off thinking, believing, telling whoever would listen. Guess what? My girlfriend, my fiance, my wife, whatever, however early on it was, she's amazing. She's the best. Nobody can, can top her. But for far too many of us, we engage in that kind of speaking from a place of, of insecurity. See, at the beginning, we're insecure. And so we're looking to her to make us secure. And we, we are so enraptured by her. And we honestly believe how amazing she is because she makes us feel so good. But then as life comes, as the relationship matures, and we didn't know what we were supposed to do, we didn't know the kind of man we were supposed to be in order to foster a high fulfillment, a high passion, and a high companionship marriage because we didn't know any of those things. Then we start getting disillusioned. And all of a sudden, she starts to look a bit more like a thorn bush in our eyes. And here's the problem. If we were to ask God what he thought of her, I don't think he would say, yeah, she's a thorn bush. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we are mm, on our own in that perspective. Now, I want to throw in a, a caveat, an asterisk here. This does not mean that, that if a relationship is struggling, if, if a marriage is failing or whatever, this does not mean that it's all because we didn't see her correctly. Obviously, there are many dynamics going on, and she does bring her own issues to the table, okay? So this is not a, a, this is not meant to be a blanket, like sweep over everything. I believe a marriage may still uh, fail or struggle, even if a man is looking at his wife truly this way, as if she is really a lily among thorns. It could still fail. It doesn't mean that this is all dependent on us. But if we want to open up the, the doors wide for, for fulfillment, restoration, healing, or just up-leveling in our marriage, then we must get this right. So... The problem that we find ourselves in is we have all of this evidence that has built up in our favor, apparently, where, no, she has done this, she has done that, she's always this way, blah, 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 blah. And so we, can, we convince ourselves that, that we're right, that as our, as our perception of her starts to crumble, that it's justified. But I'm sorry if anybody was justified in lowering his perception of his bride, it was Jesus. If anybody was justified in saying, you know what? I can't take it anymore. I'm up here hanging on a cross for these people who are yelling at me and telling me I'm a sinner, who are telling me I'm a hypocrite, who are telling me that I'm a blasphemer. I'm out. I'm going to go ahead and remove myself from these nails. I'm going to heal up my wounds and I'm going to shoot into heaven because I'm done with this. If anybody had a right to that, Jesus did. And we think we have a right to it. And if, if we find ourselves in a situation where our wife or Oh, the woman that we're in relationship with or, or just thinking towards the future. If we find ourselves in a situation 
where it is very, very challenging for us to see our wives in this way, then we have work to do on our own between us and Jesus. And we've got to stop pointing the finger at her that she's got to change so I can see her different. You too, brother. <laughs> Thanks, bud. I'm trying. <laughs> By the way, I'm preaching to the mirror, all right? <laughs> you guys just get to watch. <laughs> so if we have a hard time seeing our wives according to their true identity, then the responsibility is ours. It is not hers. It doesn't mean that you go become, live in denial. It means that you can see her for everything she is and you can still have the supernatural love of God for her. So we have this beginning of our marriage. We say this with such passionate fervor then we start to get disillusioned and maybe along the way of that disillusionment we are still saying it but now it's become more of a hoping begging pleading for her to see us and for her to be moved to desire us because of the fact that we're, we believe she's beautiful. We think she's hot. We think we're so attracted to her and all that stuff. And, and at the beginning, it's insecurity. And later on, this is still insecurity. We are trying to convince her to be happy because we're, we're saying such good things about her. We're trying to prove our, our romantic love for her with romantic gestures. Oh, congratulations, Tony. I just saw that 47 years yesterday. Good for you. Fantastic. Wow. Got thumbs up there from bud. Um, so we're trying to prove it with all these romantic gestures now. And now we're trying to get her to fill the void that she was kind of filling early on. And then all of a sudden, she stops filling that void so well. And we're desperately trying to get her back. We're desperately trying to satisfy that black hole inside of us. And so we put on this front of romance, trying to convince her that she is the lily among brambles, but it's all coming from insecurity. My wife, I said the words black hole, my wife, like, and this is not against her, she's right, but there were times in our marriage where she said, I just feel like you're a black hole, like I can never satisfy you. And that hurt to hear. Because in my mind, I was justified. There were all these marital desires and needs and relationship goals that I wanted and needed, and, and they weren't happening. But, but so she thinks I'm a black hole. I think I'm justified in wanting what I want. The wires are going to stay crossed until I get secure. So. Jesus could treat us the way that he did. He could face all of our ugly. He could step down into the muck and the mud with us, into the brambles and the thorn bushes, because he was unshakable, because he was the ultimate insecure. He knew 
who he was. He knew his identity. And so nothing that we threw at him could change it. We posed literally zero threat to him. Even if we, even if we betrayed him, spit in his face, walked away, it, yeah, it might bring him a lot of pain. But it never caused him to get insecure. It never caused him to question his worth and his value. And, oh, he must not be that good of a savior after all. I must not be worth it. I thought I was pretty cool, but they've got their their whole world happening down here without me, and they seem to hate me. There was nothing like that going on. Nothing could shake him. And I and I and I picture it like I, I don't know in in movies or whatever. You know when there's like either like a space exploration movie when they're re-entering the atmosphere or maybe a Marvel movie if there's like a superhero who's flying and, and also re-entering the atmosphere. There's like the, the heat and the kind of the burning up that's happening all around him, but he's still able to keep pushing through, possibly Superman, right? And he's able to keep pushing through that burning up atmosphere. And and I picture that like like Jesus, like he can stand there and he can just withstand the onslaught of heat and flame and anything that can be thrown at him and he can keep his eyes fixed forward. It's a tall order, but this is what a secure husband looks like. How do we get there? Uh, <laughs> how do we get there? Well, it's a long, I believe it's a long answer. And actually, that's, that's what we spent so much time on in the ranks of Adulam is all of the groundwork to get there, right? Like all this inner work. But I will say this, like, starting point is twofold. going to battle with what's in here because the word says that we become transformed by renewing our mind we get lazy with this thing and we allow how we feel to dictate how we think so when we're in a marriage where we're starting to feel a lot of pain we're starting to feel disconnected we're starting to feel bitterness on the rise that starts to plant the thoughts in us and we go with them. So it's like what I say in, in my book at a couple of different places, or maybe just one, I don't remember. Um, turning point for my marriage was, was dis, the discipline of daily getting up, going out with the Lord, and putting on my lips what was true. Putting on my lips, God, even though like, so even though I woke up in pain, emotional pain, whatever, even though I was outside walking, feeling disconnected and like, I, I don't know how to get back connected with my wife, I would put on my lips, God, I thank you that I'm a good husband. I thank you that I'm a good man. I thank you that in order to be okay, I don't need anything from my wife. And God, and this is all, it feels like lies, but it's all in accordance with scripture. So it's truth. And I would even then, then we, then we take it up a notch. We say, God, I thank you that my wife is a crown on my head. She's a gift. I thank you that she is, that she is a, a precious daughter of God. She is your princess. And I thank you that you have given her to me to love. Yeah, I see these comments in here. Yeah, 
would be her leader, not her boss. That's good. Yeah. And there's always a tall mountain, higher goal. Yeah. We, there's always another level to arrive to. We're always be go, aiming to go from glory to glory in this. So maybe we'll never arrive to be to this pinnacle of perfection, but we're always stepping into the next level up. Right. And so, so I said this, this process to answer Bud's question, how do we get there? It's twofold. One of them is, is we have got to go to battle up here. We've got to stop letting our thoughts run rampant. We've got to, and that's about ourselves. It's about our wives. It's about our marriage. And two is that we have got to get deeply connected with Jesus in the midst of it all. We have got he, we have got to position ourselves for encounter with him daily. We have, and, and so much of the, of the stunting in our Christian lives, I believe, is because we, we neglect often the simple, simple requirement <laughs> of just spending time with him. And as we position ourselves to encounter him and we meet him and we do this on a, on a daily basis and we, we really, we make him the first and most important in our lives by our actions. Maybe we feel like our wife is the most important. Maybe we feel like she has the most influence over how we are doing. But by our actions, we make him the most important. We, we dedicate, we sacrifice time in our day just for him. And within that time just for him, we sacrifice our right to just beg and plead and complain about how hard our marriage is all the time. And we leave it at the door every now and then. And we just choose to put on our lips. Thank you, Jesus, that I get to meet with you. I want to know you and I want you to know me. And as we do that, the battle that's going on up here becomes easier and easier. Because we're getting transformed in his presence. We're becoming like him. Our thoughts are becoming like his thoughts. Our goals are becoming bigger than the pain inside of us. Our desires are becoming bigger than just fixing our marriage. We're starting to get healthy and having other desires, other goals. Those two things are the core for us to become like this. And I believe from there, we can branch out, we can add on other layers that, that, but like you and I have talked about before, different like things to put our hands to, going out and actually getting on mission, right? Like the book talks about and, and all of those things. We, we, we make her less of an idol that we are constantly looking up to as if she's bigger than us and she holds our fate in her hands. And as we grow and we strengthen ourselves in the Lord by, by entering into his presence and we, we apply what he's doing in here throughout the day, we apply it up here by taking our thoughts captive. Then we start to naturally grow out of this subservient position where we're looking up and we start to grow and and actually take on more of a position that we see here later in this chapter does that answer your question somewhat at least bud yeah and like i said there i mean there's a lot more that that can that we can do in that realm as well there's a lot more to it to establishing, our, establishing ourselves as confident, secure men. But none of it, I believe none of it can happen outside of those two things. Yeah, I, and I just, you just affirmed, I've, I've noticed a lot of change in the way I feel about myself. 
in recent months. <clears throat> so I know that that process of spending time with Christ and 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 uh, spending time in the truth of what He says about us <clears throat> is the key to not just believing what our identity is up here, but but living and walking it out. Yeah. So, yeah, that's right. Time is. I guess time has to be involved too because. You know, it's a transformation process. It isn't a. It isn't like flipping on a light switch. So. Right, right, yeah. It 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 takes some time to grow into that. Absolutely, um, but I think that I think we can choose the the new behaviors the new lifestyle possibly in a moment but the ease with which we engage in those behaviors grows over time you know at the beginning it's a lot of work after a while it's less work and then after a little while more it's a it's like a desire you know if we're just talking strictly with spending time with jesus is if you if we do it consistently for it doesn't even take all that long it becomes more and more of a desire in us, you know? So, yeah, I agree. It's like the, uh, when they, um, the rest of the apostles that time said that they knew that they had been with Jesus because they were not educated men, but they knew that they had been with Jesus. Yeah. Because their demeanor just showed that. Right, right. Because then you can just, you can just tell. Right, and so one of the things that I've learned is that sometimes we are changing and we don't even see it. And we get frustrated feeling like, man, I wish I was further along. And, and the thing is we are. And sometimes it takes another person, whoever that may be to be like, man, what are you talking about? You're way different than you used to be. And it's like a, it's like a slap upside the face. Like, oh man, what was I thinking? Okay. Yeah. God, you're right. Thank you. That's why David or whoever it was in the Psalms always talks about, uh, I'm going to recall the things of old. I'm going to remember what you've done. I have to remember where I've come from. So, <laughs> That's a long time on a single verse right there. <laughs> but if we, if we look a bit further into this chapter, we can see some other things. So um, the woman's talking here, as an apple tree among the trees of the forest is my beloved among the young men. So now she's talking. And it says, with great delight, I sat in his shadow. Guys, the scripture says that the husband is the head of, the, of his wife and Christ is the head of the church, right? And, and we, we often, we have this deep longing for our wives to willingly follow our lead. And I know that, that, you know, we have all the other things out there and the feminism and everything like, oh, well, we're talking about you know, submitting to your husband or submitting to your wife or whatever, the submission is, is this, is this like uh, chauvinistic, um, patriarchal, toxic, whatever. I know that there's all that out there. And sure, there are some men who, who feel like they need to be in complete dominance in their marriage. Okay. I believe kingdom submission is like Jesus and his church. We get into problems. We get into wrong teaching, wrong believing when we uh, sit by passively doing nothing, waiting around for God to implant thoughts in us before we do anything. God hates passivity. And we have accidentally become 
a church that fosters passivity because we can never do anything unless we hear a specific something or other from him. Our default can, is often inaction rather than our default being action and being in constant communication and communion with him so that when he says, hey, that's wrong, we hear it and we course correct. Action does not have to mean disobedience. It does not have to mean non-submission. Thanks for the thumbs up, Tony. See, Jesus, I believe he, he wants us to bring our thoughts to the table. And yet we can do so in submission to him. But it says that he washes us with water so that he can present to himself a glorious and pure and spotless bride. So imagine this, on a wedding day, the bride is made glorious. She is the centerpiece of that day. Everything about the day points to the fact especially the glorious wedding dress. She is elevated. She's promoted so that everybody who is there, including the groom, can see and enjoy her glory. Jesus, the bridegroom, the husband, has said Father, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. If he is the ultimate model of a husband and he is not afraid to share his glory with us, then we need to not be afraid for our wives to step into their glory. So submission from a wife to a husband, does not mean that she is controlled, dominated over, and the life is squeezed out of her. Submission of, from a wife to a husband looks a lot more like this. See, remember I said, in an insecure man, we are in this subservient groveling position as if we're looking up at this tall idol of a statue. And we're hoping that our sacrifices we bring to her will cause her to have favor on us and give us what it is that we're needing from her. But now a secure man stands over and above his wife. See, it says, with great delight. She's delighted to come into alignment with her husband. She's delighted to sit beneath his covering over her. Now, I do believe that there's some dynamics involved in this thing because in genesis it says that part of the curse is that for the woman her desire shall be for her husband and he shall rule over you it seems to be pointing to this desire these desires clashing and and in fact the fall happened kind of because eve took the reins She was deceived and ate, and Adam followed her lead. It doesn't say he was deceived. But he might have been all googly-eyed over his new wife. And so there's this pattern in humanity and it's not in every marriage, but in many of them, where, where if, if the man and woman 
begin to maybe backslide into old patterns, old fallen patterns. The woman starts to take the lead. The man becomes passive and the woman gets resentful because now she's having to operate to fill the masculine void. She's having to be more assertive, take charge of more things that she doesn't want to take charge of, but she'll do it because she's capable, but she really wishes her man would step up. Meanwhile, we have men who are sitting there saying, man, my wife doesn't respect me. She doesn't listen to what I have to say. She doesn't want my opinion about anything. I wish she would just submit and, and let me lead her. And very often, this dynamic can be healed if we, as the man, do our freaking part. We can sit around and point the finger and say, well, she's just, you know, not respectful and she doesn't listen to whatever like that. We can point at her all day long or we can rise up and become a high value man who is worth leading or who is worth being led by. where she becomes delighted to be under our covering. And so all this comes from that, that place of growing into security, growing into being secure in who we are, because then it, it the first and foremost, what it has a readout in is that we become so consumed with Jesus that he's everything for us. And we stop getting bogged down and trapped and paralyzed by the heartache inside of us because now we're understanding, oh, he can heal the brokenhearted and it doesn't have to wait for my circumstance to change. But also as we grow into this place of security, it starts to have a readout. Our life can become healthier. And as we display more health, our wife can reap the benefits of that and be moved to come under our shadow. And again, it's, it's, in that place, when there's that dynamic, I believe we're operating at our fullest potential and she's allowed to truly thrive into her fullest potential as well. And it doesn't mean her fullest potential is less than ours. It just means in this dynamic of us covering her, her following our lead, she is able to rise up and become the bad A woman that God created her to be too. It's almost like a dance where the, the, the man is in the lead. He's leading the dance, but everybody's watching the woman. <laughs> and that's okay. Because as she follows his lead and he leads well, and he leads with confidence, knowing where he's taking her, she can rest and relax into him and then dance more beautifully than she would without him. And it says in verse four, he brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. And Chad a while ago said, lead by love. Yep. And Yeah, those are good gain respect through strength of lift your spouse to the next level. Mm -hmm. But this is all difficult if we're not doing the work in and of our, in ourselves. We can't be, go about these, these things that are, are absolutely correct. We can't go about leading by love, trying to gain respect through strength, trying to uplift our spouse if we're doing it to try to, to try to get that ache to be quiet. If we're doing it to try to feel better. We can't 
It can't come from there. It has to come as we build that strength in the secret place. So he brought me to his banqueting house. Again, we're inviting her into our realm. It's a realm that we have constructed, that we have partnered with the Lord to build, to be that place for her, right? Maybe, maybe she has thorns. Maybe she is that lily among brambles. So we have to do the work to get strong, to build the strong house so that she can come into it and have a safe place where she's seen for her true identity. And it's very, it's challenging, gentlemen, because there are places in our marriages where we have desires that are very good and very right. There's nothing wrong with them. And we should probably even communicate whatever desire it is. But if we do that out of a place of insecurity, neediness, whininess, bitterness, what it can do is create over this place, create over our wives a banner that's not of love. If, if, if Often we can create over her a banner of shame where she feels ashamed for who she is because she's never going to be enough. This is that's why... That's why my wife left. Mm. She felt like she could never measure up. She told me that. Mm. Wow. That's why she gave up. That's why she gave up after 42 years. She felt like she was never going to get there. And I thought that was her insecurity. Mm. It was mine. Mm. It was mine. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It. See, you know, and we have to, we have to each search ourselves to see, is this coming from insecurity in me? Am I able to communicate this in love? And, and a litmus test is once I communicate this, if she doesn't receive it, can I walk away and still maintain my joy? Or if she doesn't receive it, am I going to get bitter and butt hurt and then treat her poorly as a result? Right? Because if we're communicating these things and we're able to maintain our joy, And we're able to maintain that atmosphere of love. Then the insecurity may be more in her. But if we're able to be secure and we communicate in love and we maintain joy so that, so that there's, doesn't mean that there can't be pain, but, but then from our wife's perspective, She's not seeing us get so demolished by her shortcomings. Instead, she is seeing that, oh man, he's, he's actually probably right about what he needs that I'm not giving him. But oh my goodness, he's actually okay. And it can actually release some of the pressure for her to start to do the work of change too. I see that, bud, yeah. So it's up to us to discern for ourselves and to discern with the Lord, am I secure in communicating these things or am I not? And it's a challenge. And yeah, bud's right. I mean, it's so easy to say, well, it's because it's her insecurity. That's, I mean... If she would just, you know, do these things that I'm asking, 
it'd be fine. It's her insecurity. It's so easy to go there. And this is not a, it's always on us if things go bad. That's not what this is, but it is a, we got to take responsibility for everything we do bring to the table. And so often, if we do take responsibility for it, it can have a beneficial rebound. I noticed, uh, I've come to realize that a lot of my wife's insecurities are because of my insecurities. <clears throat> Not totally all mine, but because yeah. of living in some insecurities that made her insecure. Yeah. In your relationship. Right. Right. Yeah. A lot of like, if you got to be careful with this saying that I've heard, but there's some truth to it is that like, I've heard it said that a lot of times your, your wife is, is a reflection of your own well-being. Mm. And, and, and we have to be careful with it because we can't take over responsibility for things that are only hers, right? We can't be in charge of her health and her healing. But um, at the same time, we are creating either this banqueting house that has an atmosphere of love and safety and acceptance, or we're creating something else entirely, which is going to have a readout in her. I can see where without that safety in me, because of my insecurity, she wasn't able to open up and that didn't allow her to talk about some of the things that she was insecure about in mm -hmm. herself, things that really had nothing to do with me, but she wasn't secure enough in our marriage to be able to express those. And that, that didn't allow her to seek healing. Yeah. She felt she had to hide that. Yeah. Right. Right. And if we are not secure in ourselves, it's going to make it very difficult for us to trust her if she really is sincere in wanting to bring health and healing to the marriage, it's going to make it very difficult for us to trust her. And so we'll continue to keep on coming back to the same old problem. That's not getting better. And the same old thing that we keep on saying we want. And she's like, I know, I know, I know. I need you to trust me. It'll be very difficult for us to trust her if we're not, if we're not securing ourselves by trusting in that time with the Lord. So our trust in him grows, but also just that we are secure as men. And in fact, that we trust ourselves. And that's not a bad thing to trust that I can make it to trust that I can be okay, to trust that I can actually do life even if this thing in my marriage doesn't shift. So we don't trust her. Now, again, all of these things are specific to individual situations because there are women who are not trustworthy. There are women who are not automatically earning our trust and maybe it's, it's actually a good thing for us to, to wake up and realize, oh, I, I actually can't trust her. Because there's a time when we become so nice guy and such a pushover that we just trust until kingdom come and we don't even realize that she's not honoring the marriage and she's not, she's not in it. Right? So please, don't take this stuff too far. This is all assuming that the wife wants good. Because to, there are too many marriages where both of the, both of the spouses want a good marriage. <laughs> and yet they somehow can't seem to find it. So. We create this atmosphere 
And we've got to be secure. We've got to become a high value man in order to do it well. And then we have like this picture of the woman who is like just just completely overtaken by him. She's just, she's madly in love with him. And she's so excited. She says, oh, his voice, he's coming over the mountains, bounding over the hills, uh, like a gazelle and a stag. Um, <laughs> and this is, again, this is just another picture. He, she's so excited when he's coming from somewhere far off. She's so excited about him and he hasn't just been revolving around her with all of his waking time and energy. See, Eve was so much more attractive than everything else God had created. I believe that Adam just was like, well, the command to go take dominion. I'll get to that when I get to it. But <laughs> this woman is what it's all about. Now, obviously, the Bible doesn't say that, but it sure looks to be what it could have been. Because why the heck wasn't he off obeying God's command to go take dominion? Why was he still hanging right around the center of the garden where the tree was anyway? So it says, this man is so attractive because he has more to his life than just his wife. And he's coming from somewhere far off doing who knows what, conquering who knows what. And that is attractive. That creates desire that he was doing the thing that he was meant to do, that he was off living his life, that he was already in the process of building and going after before she came into the picture. And the fact that he isn't always available to her actually creates more of her availability to him. Far too often, as a man who's wanting more connection with his wife, he's constantly available. He's, he's even reticent to go out, literally to go out of the house and do something if he's not working to go even to the gym. He's reticent to go to a men's group. He's reticent to go just go for a hike or go hang out with other friends. He's reticent to do all of that because he wants to be right there and ready for anything she could possibly need because he's wanting to get her happy so she can be in the mood. And it doesn't work. <laughs> I see Bud shaking his head. It doesn't work. The man has got to have his own things that he's doing that don't necessarily involve her so that she is not taking the place of an idol. Because when she becomes an idol, she loses respect for the one that's serving her. But if the man is a high value man who stands as a covering over her, who knows his identity, who knows his mission, who knows who he is, then he can serve her like Jesus washed his disciples' feet <clears throat> without losing any of their respect. Then the service and the romantic gestures have their intended outcome rather than just being one other thing to add to the pile of all the ways that we've been trying to get her attention.
So it's from that, from this place of her, of there being space to create the, the tension of wanting to be together, but not being together and her wanting to be with him, but him not being available because there are other things that are priorities. It's all of this tension and this polarity that, that leads her to say, to actually, uh, I'm sorry, to, that leads her to actually value, to like it when he says, arise my love, my beautiful one and come away. When he's actually enticing her and seducing her, he's initiating and she likes it. It's because there is the tension and, and the trap that too many of us nice Christian guy husbands fall into because we're constantly trying to just die to ourselves and always be everything she ever needs is, is we've, we've gotten rid of all the tension. We've stopped being ourselves, which as, a, as one whole person relates with another, there's going to be tension. There will be conflict. So we've gotten rid of the, the two individual beings tension, and now we've become a lot more of just a chameleon to be whatever she needs in the moment. And we also get rid of the actual distance tension. We get rid, we, we don't stretch like a rubber band would stretch in tension because we're always just right there. And we wonder why our wife doesn't want us. This is Matt Halleck signing off and thanking you again for being a part of the Man Warrior King community. If you want more, head over to manwarriorking.com. And please remember to take just a couple seconds to subscribe on iTunes and to leave a five-star rating and a review so that more and more men can join us as we become awesome. You are a kingdom man. Go out, take more ground, push back darkness. Remember, you bring value into your home, your work, and your circle. You are not a taker. You are a giver. Abundance is your atmosphere.